it a delight to be here with you. I welcome you to our campus. I spoke with our president of the university and our provost, two people who matter to me a great deal, and they were so delighted to have you on campus. It's an exciting time where we do look in the room and find people who are kindred souls who are inspired every day to have the audacity to just think, yeah, I can make a difference today. Imagine that, having that audacity. And I want to introduce you to someone who I believe in. I think of one word, audacity may be it. <laughs> when I called and said I would be introducing him, he was delighted. <laughs> All of his life, he, since an early child, he wanted to be introduced by a dean of the College of Education. <laughs> Well, I think in knowing someone, it's important to spend time together. So I sent him one of my books to read for him and his family to spend time together. Obviously, the impact of my writing had significant moments here. And I was glad that my writing could offer him a moment of bonding for your child, at the very least. But when I told him who was going to be in the audience, we see the real Casey Beth. There he is. And as a man who seems to spend his life dancing his way through, this kind of captures who he is. But what I really think I appreciate is he is a man who understands about being with grace. He's surrounded. Oh, I got an awe out of that one. <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, the teaching is about relationships. It's about the families. It's about the family that we have in schools. It's about the relationships that matter to us. This guy has spent some time figuring a way out. I mean, he couldn't figure out his career. He fought the, the, the urge to be you know, a teacher, to do things that really matter. So he pretended to be a scientist for a while. Fort Valley State did what they could and sent him on his way. The University of Georgia did what they could and sent him on his way. He was a plant genetics scientist. What in the world is that all about? And instead of spending time in the dirt looking at leaves, he found an opportunity to do what really matters. And even today, he continues to do research, and I believe, if I got this right, working out of Georgia Tech, among other places, looking at Alzheimer's and, and investigating cures for the ills, the ailments that persist. God, oh, talking about things that matter. Oh, by the way, he's been a middle school and high school teacher, too. It is a privilege and honor to have on our campus all of you and to welcome you, the Teacher of the Year for the State of Georgia. Casey, come meet our family. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, I got a good teacher. 
future voice, I promise. It's not their fault, it was mine. He showed the picture, my baby picture, and got me all nervous and flustered. I didn't want to show you what I looked like as a child. <laughs> but listen, I want you guys to do me two favors. One in the beginning, and one in the end. Are you ready for these two? First things first. We gave a round of applause a moment ago, but I wasn't satisfied. So, the high school students in the room, come on and stand up. And then the pre-service teachers who are in the room, come on and stand up. And all the people who are practicing educators, let's give them the loudest cheer and round of applause that we can muster up. We should also believe in education. We should still all believe in 
the teaching profession. Teachers now have the potential to radically transform the lives of the students that sit in the classroom. Um, we need as much support as we can get from uh, the community and from parents. And as we all work together, as we all hold hands, students become better, the world becomes a better place. So good evening to you all, and thank you for this honor. with no preparation, because it's what I really, truly believe. That's what I fell back on when they called me to the podium. What did I say? I said, we should all still believe in teaching. We should all still believe in the teaching profession. Because even in 2017, teachers still have the potential to radically transform the lives of every student that sits in our class. I said that that night because it's what I truly believe. I say that this morning because it's what I truly believe. And I know you're here because you believe the same thing. Let's clap for that. We have the one job, the one job where we know when we go to work every day, what we do can change a person's life. We have the one job where we know when we go to work every day, what we do can make the world a better place. And we ought to recognize that. We ought to celebrate that. I'll tell you this. I've, more and more I'm meeting people who have left other professions to join teaching. They were successful at what they did. Last year's Teacher of the Year was a guy from Savannah, Georgia, Savannah Crown. He was a, a 25 year successful lawyer who figured out one day, if I win another case, I'm not changing the world. How can I change the world? Let me go be a teacher. I'm seeing that from people who were accountants. I'm seeing that from people who were, were real estate agents. I'm seeing that from people who were doing numbers of things. They are coming to this profession looking for what it is that we have, which is the fulfillment of knowing that our job makes a difference. It's surprising that they know that, and as teachers, every once in a while, we forget that. Right? So let today be the day where you rekindle that fire. Being in room with other educators and encouraging and, and inspiring each other, rekindle that fire so when you return to your class on Monday morning, you're not tired. You're, instead, you're jumping out the car, running to your class and saying, yeah, I can't wait. Right? We have the chance, right? Good. We can, we can radically transform. Say radically. Right. Transform. The lives of students who sit in our classroom. And before I sit down, what are a couple of ways we can do that? I want to ask you to go back to your classroom and be a couple of things. Say be. be. Good. I'm a teacher, not a speaker, so talk back to me. Say be. be. What is the first thing I want you to be? I want you to be inspirational. Say inspirational. inspirational. Be inspirational in the way that you build ambition in your students. Now, this is a uh, picture from my own Facebook page. You see, it was last July. July 10th, and there's a story behind this picture. I've been doing a thing at Georgia Tech now for about six years. The first few years, I went just by myself. And after like the third year, I guess I did a good enough job where they said, you can bring a couple of your high school students with you every summer. And I said, wow, now I'm really there. So every summer, I get to pick two or three of my high school students who come with me to Georgia Tech, and they're not watching. They are involved using multi-million dollar equipment, planning experiments, collecting results, sitting at the table with the scientists and discussing, making conclusions. And at the end of every summer, I posted this picture. Look what it says. It says, two of my high school students have spent five weeks conducting biochemistry research at Georgia Tech this summer. Here they are atop one of the main buildings on campus. From here, they can see their futures. It's metaphorical, right? I take them up on the last day of the summer, I take them up on the top building, of, on the tallest building of campus, and I tell them, look out there. What do you see? I want you to see, I brought you here this summer because you told me you want to be a scientist or a veterinarian or something. I want you to see yourself as already being that thing. I want you to use this summer experience to say, I see myself already being a veterinarian or dentist. And besides that, when you get back to college four years from now, I want you to be able to say, this isn't my first time. I've been here before. I remember the vision of standing on top of this building. I'm asking you to go back to your classrooms and do the same thing. I'm not asking you to do something that I don't do. Be 
inspirational. Say inspirational. inspirational. In the way that you build ambition in your students. See, it's easy to get kids to learn once they want to be something. Get them thinking about what they want to be. Get them believing that they can be that thing, and then instruction gets easy. That's something in it for you. You get them inspirational, and your job gets easier. Right? This is another one from this. This was November. This was Thanksgiving week, while other people were uh, boiling turkeys. <laughs> Look what it says. Two of my, this is this year, two of my sharpest students expressed interest in being pharmacists. I won't read it. You can read it. I'll tell you a story. I'm in my classroom, and these two guys, well, the guy on the left stood up to give a speech in class, and he says, I'm about to graduate, blah, 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 blah. I want to be a pharmacist. And I don't know what made me do it, but I asked him, I say, have you ever met a pharmacist? And he said, I mean, when I pick up my prescription at Walgreens. And I said, no, have you ever met outside of the pharmacy, not the guy behind the counter, have you ever met a pharmacist? He said, no. So I asked, who else wants to be a pharmacist? And this guy raised his hand too. And I pick up the phone, and I call, and I call, and I call the University of Georgia, not knowing if anybody would pick up. Call and call and call and beg and beg and beg. See, I only need one person to say yes. Finally, one of the pharmacy professors picked up and I said, hey, go hang up. <laughs> uh, this is Ms. Bethel. I'm from New Manchester High School. Two of my students said they want to be pharmacists, but they've never met a pharmacist. Can we please come to your campus, and will you sit down and talk with them? And he says yes. And I put those two kids in my own car the Wednesday of Thanksgiving break, and I drive them to Athens. And we tour the labs, and we see how pharmacy research is done. And they sit down with these professors, and they talk to them about what it's like to be a pharmacy student. See, sometimes when I'm in my classroom, I'm not sure if what I'm doing is getting through. But that day in that car, on the ride home, I knew that what I did that day got through. Because those young men drove home saying, Mr. Bethel, now I'm sure I want to be a pharmacist. Not only that, I'm sure I can do it. I'm asking you to do that as often as you can. And this can work in elementary school. This can work in middle school. Get your kids, your students, thinking about what they want to be, and then be intentional about connecting them to that. So be inspirational. Say inspirational. inspirational. Next thing, be intentional. Say intentional. I'm going to give you a tool here that you can really use now. Here's something you can take away and use. Um, be intentional in the way that you build student effort. Say effort. Yes. You guys that teach probably will agree with me that the big problem, one of the big challenges is students don't work hard enough. Raise your hand if you think that's true. Right? It feels like the teachers are doing all the work and the students aren't working hard enough. Do this experiment Monday morning. Walk into your classroom and say, how many of you guys are trying your hardest? I bet you all their hands go up. And you say, what? Do you see what I see? Some kid is going to have his hand up, and you're going to be thinking, you haven't done any work in like six days. <laughs> the issue is that they don't see what you see. And this was my challenge. I said, man. My kids, my students aren't working hard enough. So how can I get students to notice their own effort? How can I get students to accurately diagnose their own effort? And I got to do this quickly. It wasn't my idea. I was reading a book, and I saw it in the book, and I tweaked it for me. It's something called a weekly effort rubric. Say rubric. The last five minutes of class on Fridays, every one of my students gets one of these. And I tell them, you evaluate your effort yourself. I'm not going to evaluate you. It's up to you to be honest with yourself. How does it work? The students read these five sentences, and they have to give themselves the point or not. The first sentence says, I was present and prepared for class every day this week. If that's true, give yourself the point. If it's not true, obviously you don't get the point, you know? Well, better yet, let me show you a real one. A student of mine named Jason, I can show you his because he graduated already. Jason gave himself that point. He must have been there. I don't even remember. He must have been there every day. Look at sentence number two. I paid attention and stayed on task all week. I did not have to be redirected. I tell them, if I had to move your seat even once, if I had to address you even once, you don't give yourself that point. I don't even remember, but Jason circled it. He didn't give himself that point. The third one says, I completed and turned in all assignments. The fourth one said, I did my homework or studied every night. And the fifth one said, I showed up for tutoring at least once, right? Because kids who perform the best come for extra help. And J 
Jason gave himself a free. How is this helpful? Well, two ways. First way is this. It defines for the student what effort really means. You know, now I don't have that problem of saying, how many of you guys are doing your best and all, and that doesn't happen anymore, because now they know if I'm really giving my best, it should look like this. You know, if nothing else, it has defined for the students what effort really looks like. And then secondly, I take it from them, I don't grade it, I just put it in the folder, and I keep it, and then every time we send progress reports home, which in my school system is every nine weeks, right? Is it nine weeks being back? Every nine weeks, I call them up to my desk and I show them this. I tell them, the blue line is what you gave yourself for effort. Obviously, you weren't doing nothing in the beginning. You gave yourself a zero. But look what happens. The blue line is what you gave yourself for effort. The red line came directly out of my grade. And that's an easy thing to pull. Week by week, the red line is your grade. And they can see what we as adults know. As your effort in class goes up, so does your grade. But now, it's, I've been saying that for years, but they never realized it until they see this. It's about getting them to see what, they, what you see. Here, I'll tell you this. I'm on this quest this year to lose uh, 30 pounds. Give me a round of applause. I need it. This is all right. I need the motivation. Some of you are still holding on to your New Year's resolutions, I hope. But here's why I'm trying to lose a little weight. It started on Thanksgiving. I went to my grandmother's house and, for dinner, and I had on a sweater, right? My favorite sweater. And I don't know if anybody has a grandmother like my grandmother. I walk in the door at my, at my grandmother's house, and my granny says, boy, why did you put that on? <laughs> and I said, what's wrong? And granny says, that sweater is too tight. And I look down, and I go, really? As if I didn't know, I put the sweater on. I've been putting the same sweater on for years. But she forced me to notice. See, what gets noticed gets corrected. What gets noticed gets corrected. This is a way of forcing the kids, the students, to notice their own effort. And I think I've seen this work in elementary schools and in middle schools, too. You might just change it a little bit. It might not be five sentences. It might be three sentences, right? And it might not be the same wording, it might be different wording. You know, did you bring your backpack to school? Did you put your stuff in the cubby or whatever it is? I don't know what else your kids are doing these days. Right? <laughs> but that's something I think you can take and use. The point is, be intentional. Say intentional. In building their effort, say effort. Yeah. Next one. Be invested. Say invested. Yes. Be invested in the way that you build relationships. Meaningful relationships. This is another picture from my own Facebook page. And look at what I said, it was last summer. It says, since I'm promoting my students today, I'm over the top proud of two of my former students. Both of them have already experienced success in undergrad and their chosen careers. And now, this guy is at the University of Georgia getting it in the MBA program. And this guy is at the University of Miami getting a master's degree in design and development. Keep pushing, fellas. The whole world waits to see what you accomplish next. But these guys have been out of my class now for six or seven years. But you know what happens? They see that on my Facebook page, and they're like, Mr. Beth, I didn't, I didn't know you were still following me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm behind you, son, for your whole life. That stuff I told you when I was in my class, I meant it. I love you as a student, and I'm behind you not just for this nine weeks or this 18 weeks. I'm behind you for the long haul. And I get that through them while they're in my class, and they know Mr. Bethel really cares about me as a person. And I support them for their whole lives. And then they, they try harder for me because they know I'm trying harder for them. This is a student who's still in my class last summer again. The young lady on the far right, her, uh, is one of my favorite students. She's spending her summer participating in the very rigorous, highly competitive Governor's Auto program in the area of physics. Yay! I recommended her. She is representing New Manchester and Douglas County well. I'm so proud of her. Her junior year summer. She's off doing her summer thing, not knowing that Mr. Bethel's still checking on you, right? And then one day this pops up on my Facebook page, and she's like, 
But she said, Beth, I didn't know you were still following me all the summer. I'm like, yeah, Chasey, I'm behind you for your whole life. You need to do that too. Be, intent, be invested in the way that you build relationships with your students. The sooner you can get your students believing that you really truly love them and you're really truly behind them for their whole life. See, they're used to teachers caring about them for a couple of weeks, right? You only care about me for these. Some teachers only care about you for these 90 minutes. <laughs> if you just be quiet for the next 90 minutes. <laughs> they're kind of used to that. But when you show them that you're different, I'm behind you, son, for your whole life. You'll be surprised. Hey, tell me this. Especially in middle school and high school. Have you ever seen a student who will go to one person's class and do nothing? And then the bell rings, they go to somebody else's class, and they're the A student. You ever seen this? Happens all the time, right? What's the difference between first period and second period? It could be second period has gotten through to them and built a meaningful relationship. Students will work hard for the people that they know really care about them and not necessarily about the subject. Yeah, I care about science, but I care much more about you. So be invested in the way that you build relationships. Say invested. Yes. It, it takes a little bit, but really, you know what? It doesn't take that much. Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll, tell, I'll give you a trick. It's a joke, but it's a trick. Um, at my school, when I'm leaving school, and middle and high school teachers, anybody? Middle or high school. Good, I'm going to give you a trick. You can pull this this week. On my way, when I'm leaving school, you know, teachers, I'm the kind of teacher like, I got to run out of the building. And then if I don't leave now, I'm never going to leave. So I grab my bag. This is how it happens for me every day, about 5 o'clock, whatever. But on my way to my car, I ask myself, who's having practice today? Is it the baseball team? Is it the choir? Is it the band? Who's having practice today? And on the way to my car, I swing by their practice. And I don't say anything, I just stand in the corner. And at first, the kids are surprised. They say, what are you doing here? You don't coach basketball. And I don't say anything. I stay for like five minutes only. And then the following morning, the kids see me in the hallway. They say, Mr. Beth, I saw you in my basketball practice yesterday. What were you doing? And I say, man, I, you told me you play basketball. I came there just to see you. And then 10 minutes later, I tell the next kid, <laughs> You told me you play basketball. I came in just to see you. I saw you missed. It. Hopefully they don't tell each other, right? But I tell every kid I came in just to see you. You gotta work with your layups. But you know what? I took five minutes to get interested in what they're interested in. And then when they come to my class, I can say, I showed you interested in what you're interested in. Can you show me some interest in what I'm interested in? And really, it only took five minutes to reach 30 kids. Same thing with band. See, you know what happens? If you show up to the game, they don't notice you. Because the stadium's crowded. But when you show up to practice, you're the only one. They can't help but notice you. You know what I mean? But that's the, that's the extra. That's the meaningful relationship for being invested that I'm talking about. Say invested. Yes. It's a lot quieter in here than I hope. So here we go. Let's get a little out. Next one. I'm almost done. Say be impactful. Be impactful. Be impactful in the way that you build student confidence. Say confidence. Confidence. I've been teaching science for 13 years. And uh, I got into this because I want to help inspire young people to want to be scientists, right? But the problem is, in the beginning, none of my students picked science. When they got to college, all my students picked like economics or mass communication or something, right? Which bothered me a little bit. On the one hand, I want them to be, I tell my kids, you don't have to be a scientist. I want you to be whatever you want to be, right? But if I've been teaching science for 13 years and nobody's going to want to be a scientist, I must be doing something wrong, right? I must be making it too boring. So I thought about this. It's like, man, how can I close this gap? These are real things that my students would say to me back then. Tell me if these things sound real. They would say things like, Mr. Bethel, scientists have to be really smart. And I'm like, it's not smart enough. Have you ever, does that sound like something a student might say to you? They would say things like, Mr. Bethel, you have to be really good at science, and it's just not my strongest subject. Does that sound like, does that sound like, I would hear these things over and over and over at the beginning of my career. And I thought, man, how can I close this gap? And I got lucky. Here's how I got lucky. Uh, about six years ago, five years ago, 2012, before I knew about Ed Moto and Class Dojo and all of this, I would get every student in my class to give me their email address, right? Stick with me, I'm going somewhere. 
they would give me that email address and I would say, this is the way I'm gonna send project instructions and homework reminders and all of that, right? So give me an email address that you really check. Don't give me the fake one. And they would give me an email address. And I would use it all year, back in 2012. And then that summer, I was cleaning out my email account and I realized, hey, I still have their email addresses. I wonder if they still check these things. And I sent out a message not knowing if they would answer. I sent something out like this. I said, hey guys, thinking about you folks today, New Manchester High School misses you. Study hard, do well on your upcoming final exams. Remember, this is your first semester, your chance to make a good impression, something like that. I sent out a message, something like that, right? And um, not knowing if anybody would answer. And within five minutes, I got this answer. It says, Mr. Bethel, thank you so much for your words of confidence and encouragement. In moments like these, I really need it. Have a good rest of the school year. Notice they're the same dates, right? Straight out of my email address. Uh, it was that Christmas, not that summer. Five minutes later, this kid emailed me back and said, Mr. Bethel, thank you, I needed that right there. Now, the back part of the story is Jonathan has a mom and a dad. And an older brother who's a dentist and an older sister who's an accountant, but at that moment, he needed me. He needed Mr. Bethel. Nevertheless, that's not the part of the story I'm focusing on. Once I got answer and answer and answer and answer that day, I said, oh, wait, let's use this tool. Now, I email my students twice a year, every class. I send them something like this. This was the following August. With school opening this week, I really have you guys in my mind wondering how you're doing. You should be going back to your second year. How did your first year turn out? How was this summer? Are you still going to the same school, same age, and blah, blah, blah. And they would answer back, just stick with me, I'm going somewhere. They would answer back things like this. Hello, Mr. Bethel, my first semester turned out not good, blah, 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 but look down number three. I'm still attending Southern Polytechnic State University, known as Kennesaw State, Marietta campus, it's not official, but I'm thinking about changing my major from to mechanical engineering instead of electrical engineering. So you know what I do with that email? The next morning, I show that email to my current students, and I say, hey, any of you guys remember Gerald? Gerald used to play on a baseball team, he used to ride the bus, and most of them would say, yeah, that's Chris brother, right? Somebody, and I say, look at this, guys, Gerald's about to be an electrical engineer. And if he can do it, you can do it. I use the success of my past students to build the confidence of my current students. <coughs> Look at this next one. A young lady named Fung says, hey, Mr. Bethel, everything's going well so far. I'm currently in third year at the University of Georgia pursuing a microbiology degree, intent of pursuing an MD degree to be a doctor. And the next morning, I said, hey, guys, anybody remember Fung? Fung was on the cheerleading team. She lived in an Anaway neighborhood. Anybody? And uh, some hands would go up, and I would say, look, guys, Fung's about to be a doctor. And if she can do it, she rode the same bus, went to the same school, ate the same nasty pizza in the cafeteria. <laughs> and if she's going to be a doctor, you can be a doctor. I use the success of my past students to build the confidence of my current students. And look what's happened. Every time they send me one of these emails, I put it in a little spreadsheet, my hand to God. The numbers of my students who've chosen STEM majors in college have increased exponentially every year. I now have continuing relationships with about 65 of my students who are at different colleges studying things like physics or dentistry or whatever. But that wasn't the case in the beginning. Nobody was picking it. Right about the time I started following their progress through those emails, it started to change. And you can do that. Ask yourself this. If you teach third grade, where are the kids you taught two years ago? If you teach fifth grade, where are the kids you taught five years ago? How are they doing? What are they up to? And can you use any of their successes to build the confidence of your current students? What if the kid you taught four years ago just got the Gates Millennium Scholarship? I would tell you, you taught seventh grade. You say, hey, guys. A kid who sat in this seat in the seventh grade is now at Greenbrier High School, and he just got the Gates Millennium Scholarship to go to Stanford. So if he can do it, you can do it. You see what I'm saying? And then my last thing. Uh, this is a picture of us in my, I don't know why I have yellow pants on that day. <laughs> um, the scientists I work with at Tech, I, I, I emailed them up and I said, hey, when you guys get a new batch of lab jackets and you're going to throw the old ones away, don't throw them away. Send me the old ones. And I bleach them and I get them pressed or whatever, and I keep them in my classroom. And I tell my, this is my AP biology classroom last year, AP biology. 
And I tell them, I said, whenever you make an A on your first unit test, you get your lab jacket. You earn it. And it's something you can have. You can take it with you to college. And then, once we get to the point that everybody in the class gets their lab jacket, we can take our class picture. And I put this picture above the wall, above the door, coming to my classroom. And all year, they're waiting. They're like, Mr. Pepper, when are we going to get to take our picture? And I'm like, you're waiting on Christmas bag to make an A. <laughs> <laughs> right? But they can't wait for the chance to get their picture in the list. I got 2013, 2014, 2015, they're like, when's our turn? And then, the moment they get that picture, they walk in the door every day looking at that picture. Go back to what I said, it's all about building their confidence. Seeing yourself as already being the thing you said you want to be. Building your confidence and helping you see that you can do it. Why do I care so much about this? My time's almost up, so I will close with this story. I'll skip a little bit and tell you this story. Here's why I care so much about this. Because it's my story. You wouldn't know it today, but the guy who's the state teacher here is the child of a single parent mother, me. My mother was 19 years old when I was born. The guy who's the state teacher here now, me, is the child of a drug addict mother. My dad was on big boy drugs, not tiny drugs. Serious stuff. I've seen, I've never lived in a house with my dad. I've seen my dad in his lowest moments. The guy who's the state teacher here, me, in the third grade, my dad went to jail for 16 years. Imagine what it was like coming to school the next day, and the whole school was like, oh, that was your dad on TV going to jail, right? Imagine what that felt like. Single parent mother, drug addict father, dad is in jail, and when you're eight years old, 16 years feels like forever. It's like, I'm never going to see him again. On top of that, fourth grade at school, they found out that I was deaf in one ear. You know, they called you down to the school nurse, they put that thing on your head. And the lady's like, well, you hear the beat, right? The pencil. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you hear the beat, raise the pencil. I said, no, I heard the instructions. <laughs> How can you not raise the pencil? I don't hear no beat. <laughs> Sent me home with a note. I'm still, to this day, I'm still deaf in one ear. Never fixed it. I have insurance now. I can fix it. But I'm afraid of what the world really sounds like. <laughs> I've been doing it like this this long, let's keep it. Single parent mother, drug addict father, dad in prison, deaf with one ear, extremely poor neighborhood, gang infested neighborhood. I never got in a gang, but because I lived in that neighborhood, I was chased, I was shot at, and all this. Why am I telling you this? Not to make you feel sorry for me. Please don't walk out of here and remember my sad story, because it's not sad. I overcame all of that. It's happy. But the reason why I'm telling you this is, I know without a shadow of a doubt, that whatever level of success this is, I've reached. And I'm not full of myself. I started off by saying I'm really humble. But I know whatever this is I've reached, I owe it wholeheartedly to the teachers I had in my life. Teachers transform my life. When I look back over my time in school, first grade, second grade, third grade, every grade, ninth grade, twelfth grade, whatever, I can only ever remember being told positive things about myself. That's all I can remember. My teachers will say, Casey, you're smart. Casey, you can do it. Casey, you can be whatever you want to be. I don't even know if my teachers knew what I was dealing with at home. There's nobody to call. My mom worked two jobs. But they all said, Casey, you can do it. Casey, what do you want to be? Casey, you can get there. Casey, we're going to put you first because we know you're going to win a spelling bee. Casey, we think you're going to win a math competition. Casey, when I go to the bathroom, you take names because I can trust you. They all said these positive things to me. <laughs> They all said these positive things to me, and in enough time, after hearing it for so long, their confidence in me became my confidence in myself. Years and years and years of being built up that way, I eventually absorbed that and became my confidence in myself. That's why I tried out different careers and all this kind of stuff. Because I remember graduating high school in 12th grade feeling like, man, I can do whatever I want to do. And it was all based off of what they said. At 37 years old today, I am still running off of the fuel that those teachers embedded in me back then with their words and with their actions. So that's what I want you to remember from me. 
we have this chance to radically transform the lives of students, to shift their outcome. If I would have ended up in jail or stuck in that neighborhood, nobody would have been surprised. They might have been sad, but they wouldn't have been surprised. They would have said, you know, that's what we expect. But teachers changed my outcome. I'm here today because of Ms. Smith and Ms. Spence and Ms. Knowles and Mr. Williams. And when you go to your classroom, be intentional about not missing the chance to do the same thing. Every day when I step foot in my classroom, I'm trying to be for my students what those teachers were for me when I needed it. They gave me what I needed at a time when I wasn't mature enough to know what I needed. I didn't know what to ask for. I didn't, need, I didn't know how to say, hey, I lack self-esteem. Hey, I'm battling with this or the next. But they gave me exactly what I needed because they cared. Today we'll learn a lot of instructional strategies, and I'm excited about all of that. But, let, but because at the end of the day, we're here to make kids smart. But remember, making them smart is easier once they are ambitious. And once they are confident, and once they give their best effort, so let's not miss the chance to do those same things. Now, I love y'all very, very much. Thank y'all for the chance to speak. I hope something I said is good. Yes, sir. 